Well, I hope you enjoyed your one quarter portion of uh, sugar uh, as part of your morning tea. Uh, there'll be some remaining uh, if you want to nibble through them throughout the rest of the day. Um, however, I hope you get some exercise. If you didn't go for a run this morning, you better do something this evening. Okay. So we're going to re restart. Uh, in a moment, um, in a moment we'll, we'll be kicking off with um, the 3 m session. Millennials, mobiles, and money. First of all, I'll introduce uh, Rocky for the session. Uh oh, Rocky, you didn't tell me about your surname. This is an issue for me. I'm going to go with um, Scopoletti. Very fantastic. My wife's Italian, so I should have got that in the first place. Okay, so Rocky's Telstra's thought leader in financial services. Today, he'll explore a new study across eight countries within the Asia Pacific region, the United Kingdom and America, providing a 360 degree review of disruption and the glimpse of the next generation of financial services. So as the presentation indicates, it's a, a 3M approach. We're talking those pesky millennials, mobiles and money, the forces reinventing financial services around the world. How this enigmatic generation of self-styled entrepreneurs will transform financial services to fit their digital driven lifestyle, not the other way around. How digital technology will fuse financial and lifestyle services, blurring the boundaries between industries, products and providers. And finally talk about how the next generation cloud, data analytics, security, digital technologies will enable those institutions that leverage those options to create distributed and autonomous transaction, risk management, investment and financial services. I'd like you to welcome Rocky to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here um, today. Um, I was just thinking this morning, it's, the, it's about the 35th time I've presented this so, but I have got some new jokes, I guarantee you, <laughs> of that. Um, and I really enjoy these kinds of settings. I was talking to Michaela about this beforehand because it, it gives us a chance to actually have a conversation about it. So some of you may have seen this presentation uh, at the recent COBA conference where, you know, that was largely a, a broadcast. So uh, we're going to open up lots of areas of, uh, of conversation throughout uh, so please feel free to hop in and, and ask some questions as we go big thank you to dan for having me as part of uh, tswg's day uh, and, uh, and and really appreciate the time that you've taken for the day and the, for this presentation uh, so for those of you who've seen my presentations before in the past you'll know that i, I love my videos so i'm going to kick off by just showing you a short video which will set the scene for what i'm going to talk about over the next 40 minutes or so Millennials are all grown up now, and they're causing massive political, financial, and social change as they permeate society. We take a 360 degree view of how demographic changes and digital technologies are disrupting the financial services industry and a glimpse into the challenges and opportunities ahead. First, the mega trends. In 2015, millennials overtook baby boomers as the number one source of global income, spending, and wealth creation. Millennials won't just dominate as your customers, but also your employees, investors, and policy makers. What they want matters. Mobiles have become the link between our physical and digital worlds. Millennials may be the first generation to live their lives never visiting or engaging with a traditional financial institution. This may be the only branch they ever see. Millennials vote with their money. From mobile banking to crowdfunding, payments, wealth management, loans and investing, there's an app for that. And up to two in three millennials have already or are considering using fintech. Did you know 90% of bankers believe fintech will have a significant impact on the industry's future? So why do only 50% believe their institutions are generating value from their digital partnerships? Collaboration is king. 
This report looks at technology through life's remote control, the mobile phone, and where institutions will need to digitally transform in order to compete against platform-based, data-intensive, and capital-light business models that are predicted to have the greatest disruptive impact. We outline how emerging digital technologies, including blockchain, artificial intelligence, cloud, data analytics, and security, enables institutions to create networked ecosystems for the provision of transaction, risk management, investment, and financing services to win millennials. To learn more or download a copy of the white paper, visit telstraglobal.com slash millennials. I'll show you a link to the report's website at the end. So everything I'm going to show you, uh, including the videos, other than my jokes, will be on the, uh, on the report's website. Um, so I'll just spend a moment to just explain a little bit about uh, the report. Um, this is the 11th report I've published over the last eight years, looking at how demographic change and digital technologies are impacting the financial services sector. Uh, it's probably one of the largest studies done in the world on, uh, on, on that topic. Now, the lawyers make me say probably. Uh, of, I, can, I can assure you of everything that I've read, uh, it is absolutely the largest uh, uh, report published of that kind. There's been some other terrific studies published. LinkedIn did a great study on, uh, on millennials and mobiles. Facebook have also done a great study. Uh, as has KPMG. Those studies tended to concentrate geographically on millennials in one area, such as the United States, uh, or they tended to sort of focus on the mass affluence sort of side of uh, millennials. Uh, this study here was across eight countries, Australia, Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, Hong Kong, China, UK, US, uh, with a sample size of approximately 33,000 millennials, which is very, very large uh, in, 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 in a global sense. Um, the study was broken up into sort of three different parts. The first part was really looking at how millennials are using mobile applications when it comes to financial services. What's the stuff that they're looking for? How are they searching for financial related stuff? What time of day are they searching for, for stuff? We looked at it in, in, in great detail. The second part of the study was then to present to them four very disruptive concepts that they could have in the form of experiences with their financial institution and then tested what their reactions would be to those uh, concepts. How might that change and alter their preferences? The third area was then looking at FinTech. Uh, we unpacked 63 FinTechs who are specifically targeting millennials and looked at the underlying value propositions and where they're trying to sort of take, uh, take, take their, uh, their propositions in terms of targeting millennials. So, Feel free to hop in and ask questions as we go. I'm happy to sort of pause and do, do a little bit of deep dive in any areas that, that, uh, that you might be interested in. Now, I'm gonna begin by talking about 2015 because 2015 was really the year that we had to hit the reset button on the industry uh, because there were four very significant developments that occurred uh, in 2015, which give us cause to completely rethink our <coughs> approach to the industry going forward. And I'll spend some time sort of going, going through each and every one of these. The first relates to demographic change. Uh, so ironically enough, the first report I published uh, going back eight years ago was on Generation Y, uh, which is in effect millennials, or another, another descriptor for millennials, which are those that are broadly aged between 18 and 34. Now back then, uh, what I wrote about was how millennials will fundamentally transform the financial services sector. And I guess now we can, so with the benefit of time, we can sort of uh, look back and sort of say, well, they've now arrived. They're now here and they are absolutely disrupting the sector. They make up about one in three in the population, which is about two billion people. Um, Globally, here in Australia, they make up about uh, about five and a half million people, and we define those as a demographic that's aged between 18 to 34 years. Now, um, what's important uh, to to note, firstly, is they simply cannot be homogenous, and they're not. So we can't sort of expect that an 18 year old is going to behave exactly the same as a 34 year old. It doesn't happen. There are three very, very important life stages that millennials traverse. The shift into adulthood. For most millennials, that, that happens at 18. For some, it's a little bit a little bit later. 
the shift into professional life uh, post sort of uh, ed their education period and then the shift into family life which on average occurs between 30 to 35 and in each of those life stages their core financial needs change and again so we can't think of them as being homogenous uh, we've really got to get in, uh, in behind it so why should financial institutions care about this demographic well there's three reasons why the industry needs to care about them the first is they've now become the global source of income production. They produce more income as a demographic group than any other demographic. And their proportionate representation in the workforce implies that that is only going to increase in terms of its importance in time, not lessen. So for example, in the Australian workforce today, they make up uh, approximately one in three by 2020, which is just there. They'll be one in two in the workforce by 2025 be two in three in the workforce. This is the generation uh, that is now powering the superannuation system and will take it from its two trillion dollar um, uh, position today to its next evolution uh, in time. Now for the superannuation and wealth management sort of side of the, the sector, uh, this is the group that is going to fundamentally transform superannuation as we've understood it today. And the reasons being is that if you follow what demographers are saying, this is the generation that is likely to have seven career changes throughout their professional life. Now, career change isn't sort of moving employers. They're gonna move employers every two to three years on average. Every time one of those things, <coughs> events occurs, it will cause a trigger event for a millennial to rethink their superannuation relationship. And the super side of the industry has never really had to accommodate that. They've had the benefit of having employers on the industry side really be the, the customer acquisition part of their, their, their business. And they've now got to completely rethink that side of it. Now, when it comes to wealth management, there's two parts to that story. The first is what are they going to create organically in their own right through employment, through everything else that they, they do in their lives. The second part of this relates to intergenerational wealth transfer. Now, if you look at wealth in Australia, 51% uh, uh, of the national wealth sits with 30% of the population, which is those that are aged 50 and above. Uh, now, as uh, the older baby boomer and pre-boomer people uh, leave Earth, that wealth will move intergenerationally and it will move onto generations, um, uh, onto Generation Y and onto millennials. Uh, now, the important point here is that you can't assume that the legacy relationships associated with that wealth move intergenerationally. It doesn't happen that way. Millennials have got their own financial affairs, their own financial relationships. As that money moves, it's going to move onto the relationships that they've already chosen and decided. And so as a financial institution, you've got to decide whether you're going to be a, uh, a beneficiary of that wealth or a victim of, of that. So the way that you think about managing your customer relationships uh, through time is going to be absolutely critical. So uh, they generate more income and that income goes into accounts. They, uh, they are uh, also the creators of wealth. And then the third reason why financial institutions need to care about this generation is because this is the transactor generation. They have more disposable income to spend, and they do, than any other demographic group. Uh, and so for those three reasons, they are very, very important to the future of a uh, financial institution. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as, uh, as we get into the presentation. The second reason why 2015 was such an important inflection point is that the mobile device has now become the primary device upon which people are accessing financial services. And in a mobile first financial services world, we've got to think about digital differently because people's expectations of the experiences that they get through that device is completely different to the expectations that, that they've got uh, with any other digital platform. Okay, I'll talk more about this as we get into, into this. The third area relates to our consumption of apps. Uh, so what took Hollywood 100 years to become a $100 billion industry took the app industry seven short years. We have developed an unquenchable thirst for mobile applications. Now what happened in 2015 was that the type of applications that we are consuming fundamentally re, uh, uh, rebalanced. 
So up till that point in time, most of the apps that we were consuming were information related, education related, uh, gaming related, entertainment related. In 2015, we saw a shift towards the consumption of lifestyle based applications. Financial services was one of the fastest growing categories of apps consumed in 2015. Approximately 720 million was spent by the industry on mobile applications. 450 million of that was on banking apps, 150 million of that was on insurance apps, and then the rest were wealth management and uh, PFMs and, and the like. And according to the uh, analysts, uh, financial services applications and the investment uh, in that category is expected to grow at a CAGR of 21% out to the next five years. So it'll be one of the fastest growing categories of applications that we're gonna be consuming through, through the course of time. The last area relates to um, collaboration. So with the benefit now of some five years of FinTech, we can now sort of step back and look at institutions and, and ask the question, why is one institution outperforming the other or its peers when it comes to innovation? Why is that so when these two institutions, whether they're banks, insurance companies, wealth managers, whatever, why is it that one is outperforming the other when they share a similar heritage? They might be organisations that could have existed for 100 years. They share a similar business model. Why is this, why, why is this happening? You, it can be explained through the approach that one institution is taking to innovation uh, and the cultural change that institutions have gone through which now they are benefiting from having an outside-in perspective to innovation versus an inside-out perspective. And again, you can look at institutions, whether they're banks, insurers, or whatever, you can point it to exactly that, their approach to digital partnerships, which is making the, the, you know, the fundamental difference in innovation performance. And, uh, and I think for those organisations who have struggled with this, uh, it's because innovation up to more contemporary years has been a function of something that you do internally. Uh, but innovation is no longer about what your capacity within your organisation is all about. It's about how you partner and how you bring in innovation from, uh, from the outside. In, we're, we're, we're fortunate to have a terrific relationship with many of you, including the TSWG group, uh, when it comes to digital partnerships. So it's the, your approach to digital partnerships and the way that you look at innovation from an outside in perspective, which will define whether you fit within that category of organisations, which will outperform the industry or your peers uh, going forward. Um, okay, so um, if we accept that the future of a financial institution uh, and the future performance of that institution can be defined by its capacity to attract the demographic that is only going to become more important to them um, through the course of time. And if we accept that that demographic has already chosen and decided that mobile devices are the preferred access mechanisms to financial um, uh, services, then those two become lead indicators of the future performance of an institution. So to set the benchmark, I created an index, and I'll just take a moment to explain how this index works. Uh, so this is look, obviously looking at the Australian market. We'll develop this uh, over the coming years to, to take on um, other markets. So the index is calibrated um, to the Australian national average. And so, um, so what we're interested in is two questions. How are institutions performing? relative to the national average? And then secondly, how are institutions performing relative to one another? Now, calibrating that at the national average, the Millennial Index uh, illustrates the proportionate representation of millennials in our population, as I mentioned before, five and a half million people or 26%. Running across the Mobile Index, <coughs> this is the proportionate of those millennials who engage their institution using mobile apps, which is 76%. So the dead centre, the 100%, represents 26, 76. So then what we're interested in is, relative to the 76, 26, uh, how are institutions performing? So those institutions that sit to the right of that index are outperforming the national average. Those that are to the left of the index 
are underperforming relative to the national average. Does that kind of make sense? So we'll talk a little bit about this. So the leader, uh, beginning from our far right and working our way across, is Bank West. So the way to interpret this uh, is that Bank West, relative to the national average, uh, has a higher proportion of millennials in their total customer base uh, and a higher proportion of millennials in their base relative to other financial institutions. The size of the, 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 size of the bubble, which is the third dimension that I uh, have added, represents the average size of wallet. This is the total amount in footings that millennials with those, uh, uh, with those institutions spend with those institutions, uh, which is uh, on average about 87. Um, then, uh, sorry, uh, what did you have a question? Yeah, that was it. Oh, right. Because okay, okay. it was the second time I've seen the slide and I never, I just didn't want to miss the context of what yeah. the size of that bubble was. Yeah, yeah, it's the average size of wallet. Now, having said that, what I would say is exercise a high degree of caution when you're dealing with averages. I, as a researcher, I don't like averages. I think they're, they, they're, they're, they're helpful from an illustrative perspective, but it can also lead you down the wrong path. Uh, so, uh, so we just need to be careful with averages, uh, particularly when you're dealing with products like mortgages, for example, which might heavily skew um, that, uh, that particular number. The, the, the number does not represent the depth of a relationship in terms of product penetration. It represents exactly what it says, which is the average spent in terms of all products uh, what, what does that mean? Is that, is that uh, the size credit of credit cards, deposits? personal loans, mortgages, right. uh, deposits, deposits, everything, everything goes everything, better. Everything, yeah. And that's what I mean about it. It doesn't represent the depth of relationship if you're looking at uh, product It's still a fair way to measure, isn't it? Well, it's it's an average. So again, we just need to be careful because you know some millennials, for example, with some of the institutions, I won't name who they are. Uh, they, ha they tend to have mortgage products more so than any other product, which will then skew that number. Uh, and that number, although as big as it might be, might lead you to believe that they can say, you know, they've got very deep relationships, they haven't. They just have, you know, a lot of mortgages. Millennials just have to use that institution for mortgages. And that's what I mean about, we just need to be careful in how we interpret that number. Um, but what you can say is absolutely, that the CBA group, inclusive of Bankwest, which is a subsidiary of the CBA group, is outperforming the market uh, when it comes to looking at these these uh, these dimensions. Um, it'll be interesting to see where ANZ moves um, over the coming um, twelve months, uh, particularly given that at the moment they have Apple Pay to themselves, uh, and you know, anecdotally, and what's been reported in the press is that that's been a rip roarer for them in terms of customer acquisition, particularly targeting millennials. So again, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be too surprised to see that bubble shift over to the right uh, when we look at this um, uh, over, the, over the next 12 months. Okay, so uh, now on the left-hand side, Westpac, um, might be a surprise to many of you, but you know, Westpac has an aging customer base. Uh, their wealth management business, you know, really sort of created that for them. Uh, so, uh, so, so, you know, they they are investing significantly when it comes to mobile app mobile applications, and according to Forrester, uh, uh, and how Forrester rank institutions, they've now become the global uh, number one in the current year. Uh, in terms of uh, the benchmarking index that, um, that they use. Okay, let's talk about the community banks. Um, so what this chart reflects is really two things. The first is that relative to uh, other um, institutions and relative to the national average, the community side of our market um, has a aging customer base uh, compared to uh, again the national average and, uh, and others, that that won't be of any news to to you. I think probably the way that it's represented here might. Um, and so, being demographically relevant is a key issue for, for this side of the, the the industry. The second point that uh, that this illustrates 
is that when it comes to mobile engagement, mobile digital, that uh, of the millennials that do um, bank with these uh, the community side of the industry, they don't engage them to the extent that other millennials do with major financial institutions. So being mobile digital relevant and being attractive to the younger demographic are the two single biggest issues that this side of the industry really is, uh, is, uh, is staring into. Now, um, so there has never been a more significant time to really stare into this because again, the future performance of an institution can be defined by its capacity to be attractive to the demographic that matters. So as you would all know, the older your customers get, the less profitable they become. Uh, when they run off debt, they're less profitable to you. So if you're not replacing uh, those customers that are running off in terms of profitability with those customers that are running on in terms of profitability, then your business may in fact be running off. That's really the, the, the net net of this. Um, but one of the things that I would say is that the barriers to competition are increasing exponentially because you've now got to pinch the limited pool of millennials off those who are having experiences set by players that are investing significantly in digital. And so your experience uh, has to be either you know, at parity or better than uh, the experience that's currently being served up to them. And so there's never been a more important you know, reason to think about how you approach that, uh, particularly working with groups like TSWG in the, in the pursuit of that. Um, so, questions on this? so there's a couple of obvious um, uh, institutions that are out there, HSBC, City, ones like that. Yeah, if you had to no, take a stab at where they were, where would you put them? Oh, oh uh, well, so City is over on this side. Uh, and that's because city targets specifically for 35 plus. There's no, there's no surprises in that. City, city go after the mass affluent side of the market. Uh, so they tend to affluence again this heavily skewed to sort of 35 plus. So there's no, no sort of surprises. surprises. <coughs> Can't remember where HSBC is. Um, but HSBC in Australia go after the same base as what City go after the yeah. city mass affluent. Any other questions on that? Just a quick one. Um, are there any kind of like you know, um, insights or reasons given in terms of why you know like Combank and Bankwell if they were moving in terms of you know having winning the competition you know affirming that many millennials? Why choose one of my energy sites? Why are they doing, why are they doing that way? Or I mean, compared to I think a lot of it has to do with heritage. City CDA has been investing in student banking since we, we probably all went to school. We can all remember the money tins and you know the the, the bankers loitering in the quadrangle. Um, so uh, so I think a lot of it has to do with that. I think the big story for CDA is that. Um, uh, in making the investments that it has made in student banking, which is not profitable, right? Um, and so they, they, they had in the past experienced a lot of churn from really the ages of 18 onwards, because that's when a lot of the other institutions would target propositions and try and, try and attract, uh, attract those groups. I think their digital experience now is is, is probably corrected a lot of the churn that was uh, that may have occurred in that uh, in that area. CDA had the largest youth customer base of any organisation in the country. That's why they they, they, they sort of sit out sit out in that area. Um, and I think the question here is, when is the right time to consider customer acquisition? I think that's the you know that's because you can invest a lot trying to get them in the student banking area but again they're not going to be profitable to you and you've got to hope that you're going to hang on to them when they do turn that sort of profitability curve or do you wait until you know they're 18 when one life stage kicks in the shift from youth into adulthood or do you wait until you know they shift into professional life or do you wait until they shift into family life 30 to 35 this is all about sort of customer acquisition, your customer acquisition strategy 
And then the, and then the question is, how are you going to attract them when their experiences are more likely going to be formed by players who are investing significant in the individual experiences? Well, to that point, do we understand what, how likely millennials are to move to another institution as opposed to other demographics? Yeah, we're going to talk about that in the next section. Uh, highly likely is the answer, uh, but again, it's got to, you know, it's 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 got to come down to the experience. Um, here in Australia, we have such a high standard of performance in products, and those of you that have been in other countries will, will know that. I've just come back from the UK. If you look at the mobile apps that the UK banks are serving out to their population, compared to here, you know we, we we've left them behind by a long shot. Uh, so we've set a very, very high standard of product performance, uh, but you're now competing in the experience economy, and it's much, millennials want more than just products. Uh, you know, products is just something that they'll, they'll, they'll compare you with. There's nothing wrong with that. that. That could be the right strategy, it's just the way you think about your strategy. Yes, I thought I'd just add, Rocky, on that youth thing, I was actually working for NAB at the time, when the New South Wales Department of Education put that whole school banking thing out to tender. Yep. Um, Com Com Combank had it, Combank were keen to get rid of it. The other, nobody tendered for it. Yep. And Combank got left with it. I think they're quite happy at the end of the day, they probably got left with it. Yep. But they, they couldn't find another bank. None of the major banks even submitted proposals for it. Because at that stage, economic rationalism was all about the cost to provide. That's right, that's right. That's right. You couldn't, you, you just you, couldn't service you, it. You, you couldn't justify it. The interesting thing is the, um, we've now got institutions like St George in New South Wales that uh, has been targeting student, you know, student youth banking efforts at school get, uh, get access to you know, St George as well as CBA and others. NAB at the time I think had, the, had a terrific product which was a combination of an international student card, uh, a transaction account and I think it was a credit card as well, I can't quite remember what the, what the what the mix was, but that was targeting the 18 year olds. They're going into uni, they need access to discounts, coupons and the like. They needed a transaction account and they needed a, a, a credit card. So that's what I mean about other institutions would cherry pick um, millennials off at different sort of life stages. Yes. Um, is, there a, is there an explanation to why it would appear that Bank West, which which would be you know CBA's smaller sibling, seems to be outperforming CBA on at least two of those three criteria? Yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably acute to Western Australia. Right. Uh, uh, timing in terms yeah. of boom times in Western Australia. Yeah. Right. Uh, but also heritage. Those of you that have been to Perth will you know notice that you're in the Bank West territory. Mm. <laughs> we step out the airport, very heavily dominated, very uh, entrenched within the WA market. Um, you know, the things that I would say, the big opportunities for the community side of the industry, it really came out in what Jock said this morning. He summarised it beautifully by saying, you know, you've got to find uh, what community needs, but in a more contemporary way, because community historically has been based off something that is geographically defined or defined by association or by common interest through employment or, or other. Those boundaries no longer define what you know community needs in 2016. Now, I don't know the answer to that, um, but I think that's the killer question. I think if this side of the industry can crack that, then how you then create experiences based around that uh, will take you to the right digital you know, experience outcomes. Um, and that, that I think is, is really the key here. Um, and the, the good news is no, one, no, no, no one's cracked that DNA just yet. But, um, <coughs> I got to meet heaps of millennials when I was doing this research and I was able to actually capture some of the insights uh, in some of the interviews that, that we ran with them. So let's have a listen to what millennials have to say about this. I would switch banks like, straight away if another place offered a much better app. I would switch banks if they had a crap app. <laughs> To a millennial in a mobile-first world, 
Starting a relationship with a financial institution will be as simple as downloading that application. So the mobile device and the experience that they have in those applications will determine whether that relationship will grow and foster or whether it will in fact end. I love my bank. I'm indifferent. I can switch tomorrow if I wanted to. You can trust banks more by using an app where you can see your money, you can move it easily. There's no discrepancy and it's all laid out in front of you. I'd be happy to make big financial decisions on my mobile through my banking app if I had all the information I needed to make an informed decision. I trust the apps. I don't think that they give us enough information to make big decisions. Everything that you want through your bank should be accessible to you in your own means. If um, a new bank had a really good app that was really fast, just worked in a seamless way, I probably would change banks. I'm taking what I want from the bank rather than them wanting stuff from me. They're there as a service to me, and if there's a better service available, I'm going to take it. Millennials trust financial institutions more than they trust any other organisational type, but the way with which millennials want a relationship with a financial institution is through an experience that is embedded within their lifestyles. Technology is absolutely central to their expectations and the experiences through mobile devices are how millennials want that experience and that relationship to play out. I reckon uh, Velvet Ballet would have been a tough customer for anyone who's yeah. not the receiving end of. We're going to talk about these three topics um, and I know that uh, Jock touched on trust. I'm going to just sort of build on that as, uh, as we go through time. So there's three things that would be great for you to take away from this presentation. It would be, uh, it would be those three. When it comes to trust, um, financial institutions today have significantly greater trust than any other organisational type. And trust is talked about too liberally. What we did in the research was looked at it relatively because trust is a relative thing. It's relative to your next best set of options. And when we look at a, a millennial's life, we've got to look at what are the range of digital options that millennials have access to. Uh, and these are the options that we tested. Banks today and financial institutions have five times more trust than any other organisational type. It's, just wondering, is that trust based on their belief in regulation within Australia or does that go across globally and they don't really care as long as it's a bank they must be trustworthy? It's it's global. It's global. So across the eight countries that we looked at, this was this was the same set of results. So financial institutions today uh, have significantly greater levels of trust than those organisations who are often represented as being sort of, you know, those that are attacking the industry. Now to a millennial Trust means four things. Trust to keep my finances secure. Trust to keep my personal information secure. Trust to keep private interactions I have with the institution. And then lastly, the reputation of the institution as a whole when it comes to security. Now it's worth just sort of pausing on this because although institutions have today significantly greater levels of trust, what I say is that trust is perishable. Uh, just because you have it today doesn't mean you can hold it in perpetuity. And you see this playing out in terms of the erosion of trust when a cyber attack uh, uh, occurs on an institution. You know, when a, when, and in a world where the legislative environment is leaning more and more towards mandatory data breach notification, then the brand of the, of the institution will increasingly become exposed every time a cyber attack occurs. And the frequency of cyber attacks on financial institutions globally is increasing. Today, one in four cyber attacks is hitting a financial institution. Now, what's interesting about this as well is that in the past, people have only ever robbed banks for their money. Uh, today, they're robbing you for your personal information. Uh, we've crossed over the point now where your personal information is more valuable to them than money itself. And so this is very, very important, again, when it comes to your, to, to your rep reputation, because less than one in two millennials today are satisfied with their institution's current performance when it comes to, uh, when it comes to trust. Now, when it comes to uh, relationships, what I would say is this is the first generation who's completely spilling the whole notion of having a relationship with a financial institution. Less than one in two are 
completely neutral on the whole notion of having a relationship with a financial institution. So nobody has cracked this code. Nobody uh, has really un understood the DNA of what a relationship with a millennial really is uh, is all about. Um, and the one, sorry, the one thing I would say is that the influences of what they want in a relationship are no longer being formed from within the industry, they're being set by the other experiences that they've got in their digital lives. So their experiences with Amazon, PayPal, Google, all of these other internet companies that form a, a very, very important part of their digital lives are setting the benchmark and the standard of what a relationship really, really is. So we've got to look outside that, and that's why this quote I thought really summed it up uh, very, very nicely. But the things that are important to them, the other myth that you hear is that somehow millennials are much more liberal or relaxed when it comes to privacy and security, not so. Though privacy and security are the two most important things that millennials want in their relationship with their financial institution. Um, now, when it comes to at the heart of what they, they're looking for in the relationship, it's about personalization. Just like they can hop online now, go buy a pair of Nike shoes in whatever color they want, whatever style they want, have it delivered to them anywhere in the world they want within three days. This is about personalization. So their expectations in terms of a relationship is that you're not gonna treat them like you treat 50,000, 100,000 other people. This is about them. It's about personalization, bringing it like you're them. Uh, the second thing is that they want personalization played out in smartphone applications. That's how they want it delivered. Uh, and so this is now the case um, as their affluence increases, so does their desire for personalization, and so does their desire to have that delivered to them through uh, <coughs> smartphone apps. Now, um, the point that we sort of get to here is that we now need to accept that a millennial's physical world and their digital world are converging through that, uh, that mobile device, which is the device that they have chosen uh, to be the device uh, that delivers to them and is part of their sort of, um, part of, their, part of their, the way they live their lives. Let's have a listen to what some millennials have to say about this. My phone's absolutely something I can't live without. I do everything on my mobile phone. First thing I do is reach for my phone. Yes, way. definitely. It's a reflex pulling out my phone. Millennials use mobile applications more than any other generation and to millennials the mobile device is their connection between the physical world and the digital world. I use it to check the weather, banking, emails, sat nav, sport updates, family updates or just social media for a bit of a laugh. Anything you can do on a phone, I do, I do it on a phone. I would use my mobile banking app every other day. Just check my bank account every day because I'm always spending it. I'll check my bank account on the way into work to see whether or not I can afford my coffee. If I want to buy something and I've got to check you know, to transfer money from one account to another, definitely on my phone. I'd rather just like be able to go on a screen, know what I'm dealing with in my own environment, rather than have to you know step into their space. So I prefer to just know exactly what I'm doing on my phone, a device that I'm comfortable with in my house where I'm comfortable. We need to shift our thinking away from thinking about relationships with millennials as being a main financial institution to being their main financial app because their experience with you and the maintenance of that relationship is going to be completely about that mobile application. So if you just sort of stop and think about uh, you know, what some of those millennials were saying, it's really important to, to, to understand that um, digital may have shifted people out of branches and onto, onto digital, but the frequency of which they're engaging institutions has increased exponentially. You know, just checking my account so that I know whether I've got enough money to buy a coffee. Uh, you, you never would have walked into a bank branch in the past and said, you know, can you tell me if I've got enough money in my account to, 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 to buy a coffee? So, you know, and so again, it's, Finance has become infused into people's lifestyles. That's a very, very important message. Whether you're shopping, you know, as you heard with uh, Velvet when she was out, uh, you know, when she was out shopping, or you know, some of the others that were, that, that were buying coffee, and that's very, very important in terms of thinking about the relationship and how your services are positioned within their whole sort of digital life, rather than uh, than uh, taking a, a product approach. 
The other thing that you often hear about is that somehow millennials' uh, core needs when it comes to finance have fundamentally changed. Not so. Our research showed that their core needs to save, spend, borrow and invest is no different to any other generation before them. I think what has changed is what, uh, again, what Jock talked about this morning. If you look at the number of millennials who, uh, who are thinking about starting their own business or have a desire to start a, their own business, it's basically one in two. We've never seen that before in any other demographic. And we probably haven't seen it before because the access to entrepreneurship, uh, and the access to capital, uh, the access to all of these things never existed in abundance as they do today. And I think that's what's, uh, that's, that's what's fundamentally changed in, uh, in this mix compared to others. So there's a question. I was just going to say, with, with millennials checking their app each day, cash flow, how much money is on the account, are we seeing a reduced usage of cash more to credit cards? And According to the RBA, yeah. If you follow <coughs> what's coming through the ATM system, uh, they're uh, reporting declines in the order of about 5%, I think, in the last and year. Is that specific to millennials or right across? No, I don't think that's right across the board. Is it a bit like, a lot steeper with the millennials? It's than probably the more program? concentrated, I'd say, with yeah. the millennials. Um, okay, um, so um, the importance of technology to millennials is, is, is something that we really need to really appreciate because um, we've got to remember this is the generation that has witnessed and grown up in the digital revolution. They've seen the rise of the computing revolution, the internet revolution, the mobile revolution, and so uh, so technology is, uh, is just part of the way that they live their lives. They're the most connected, media-saturated generation ever. And so you can sort of see this playing out in terms of how they view their aspirations of what they want to achieve in their personal life compared to how uh, they see the role of technology uh, applied to their uh, financial aspirations and their financial life. The two are basically correlated. And you see this playing out in terms of their attitude towards risk, their, uh, the extent of spontaneity, uh, their, their expectations of products, and this is unanimous and universal. So across every country that we looked at, there was no statistical difference between those two and the role that technology plays in this. It's, it's again, quite, uh, quite universal. So this is a generation that when it comes to engagement, it's got to be about technology and increasingly about smartphone technology. Yes. Robert, you're saying they trust they trust privacy, they trust the security, absolutely the stuff's gotta work. They trust the holy grail for the sector has always been the trust and advisor bit. And that's to your point about the relationship piece. So when it comes to, you know, the financial needs, you know, do they trust their bank when it comes to financial advice, the financial products? Because anecdotally they don't, because they go to mortgage brokers, buy the droves for first home buyers, because they don't, they, they trust it to do the banking, sure, but they're biased, they're not gonna get independent advice, they're not gonna go there for, for the important stuff in life. Is that is that your view? No, no, I, I, so I would say empirically, advice and trust are not linked. Uh, and, Correct. Uh, yeah. and, and, uh, and I think where institutions, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the data on this shortly, I think where institutions get confused is between cross-selling and advice. Millennials don't see the two as being advice. Uh, so millennials' preference is for digital advice uh, and their preference even more acutely is to independent advice rather than, uh, rather than bank-centric so we'll come to that. We'll come to that in a, in a, in a sec. Just yet. So um, you can sort of see here that their preferences are for digital advice. Now, what I would say when it comes to advice and thinking about millennials is that um, uh, less than one in three millennials in Australia today are getting professional financial advice. Two in three have broadly rejected the whole proposition of advice as it is constructed and as it is delivered today as a, as a proposition. So the way to think about digital advice is not necessarily something that it's going to displace or knock out 
uh, it's rather a huge opportunity to tap into an unaddressed market. So again, if you come to the numbers, five and a half million people, uh, you know, there's probably three and a half million or more today that are not getting advice of any sort. And this is where your robo-advisor, this is where all of those kinds of propositions are really kicking, kicking in. So scaled advice is likely to be the opportunity area to create a advice-based relationship with the millennial that may, as their needs become more complex, involve a human element associated with that. So once they start hitting the, you know, the 30 to 35 year mark when their needs become a lot more complex, they may in fact want a human aspect uh, associated with that. So the question here is all about how do you use digital to be the catalyst to create an advice-based relationship with a millennial and then how do you augment that in terms of a advice-based experience that includes a human element. So Rocky, we've just undertaken a lot of member research within our own organisation and completely agree with you on all that. And the one thing that sticks out is for mortgages. And we found that the younger we went, the more people wanted to speak to someone for a mortgage, but they want to be able to do the research themselves yep. Yep. online and yep. then come and, it's almost for validation from a person. Yeah. And whether it is a you know, mortgage brokers are now more than half the market, that's right. or that, but they want to talk to a person. Yeah, and, and but I the self service key, stuff. Isn't it? They, you're now talking to a very informed yes. buyer when they step step into your door. Yeah, they spent hours themselves right. coming to get validation. Yeah, the first port of call would more, more likely be advocacy of some sort, right? Someone would have recommended, and this is another big opportunity for this side of the industry because as customer satisfaction has now neutralised as a point of differentiation with the community side of the industry compared to the, the majors and the regionals, you're still light years ahead when it comes to advocacy. But the problem with advocacy at the moment is that when a parent recommends uh, you know, a community product or service to, to, to their child or whoever, uh, it's a step back in experience, not a step forward compared to the standard that they might be using it uh, at this point in time. And I think that's where you know the whole digital aspect really sort of comes into play. So you know, digital advice is a huge opportunity area uh, for institutions to 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 again look at. It, it seems to be counterintuitive, Rocky. The the, uh, the more money you have, you think you want to talk to a, 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 a relationship banker or, or a personal banker or something. Yet what you're saying is they're actually going. I think when they walk in your door, they'll have done their homework right, right. much more thoroughly. So again, you are talking to a highly informed yeah, okay. person. And you know, the so the whole engagement of when they do come in your door needs to adapt and change right. uh, uh, accordingly. We'll talk a little bit more about that in terms of some of the concepts that we that we um, that we 